So I'm tucked up in my bivvy, it's not particularly cold yet, um, sort of autumn cold, that type of cold. I have been really cold in the autumn occasionally, um, even on short evening trips, but I'm going to try and get an overnighter in here and uh, see if I can't get at least one double figure car before the winter comes. I don't mind fishing for them during the daytime, but um, I figure my best chance, as I've got so much work on, is to do the work just come down it felt really strange to be honest you know turning up at like 5 5 30 um, and then just throwing some bait out he thinks it's funny that duck he thinks it's funny it's not um, just doing a night get up in the morning pack up and drive home and start work again I'm sure lots of you guys do that but if that's what it takes to catch your fish that's what it takes I probably won't do any more overnighters uh, this year on on uh, well, not this lake, any lake, it'll just get too cold and I just can't be bothered to be honest. Change species. So I'm after a double figure carp. The boilies I am on are Pacific tuna, the hard ones, I think they're 15s, 18s, 18 mil hard ones, I like those. A um, couple of beeps so far, I've been here, I suppose they've been out half an hour, but I did ground bait. There we go, see. Two beeps, two beeps, they're bream, they're almost sure they're bream. And that's what I've been getting. Which is annoying because that can wake you up and keep you going. You just lay there waiting for one to uh, to crank off. Now I've got two straight out, I've no idea sort of where I'm fishing, and I've got one just in here on the right, quite close where I'd normally fish, probably in the daytime. Um, loads of ground bait balls up, but I put boilies in with the ground bait. Just going to see what comes along. Wake me up if one of those rod goes off, because I'm going to try and get a few zeds an hour or so, it'll be nice. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be a, one of those nights. There's a full moon out there, I don't really rate a full moon uh, for carp fishing, so I'm looking really for one decent, really nice, decent, good fish. Um, what I do is, if I get pestered by Brim a lot, I, I might have to, although I want the flavour I want, or I think they want, I might have to go to a bigger boilie, a 20 mil, just to get to rid of those beeps, otherwise you just set, might as well sit up all night in a, in a chair. And the other thing I'll do is, well I've got a, sh a short drop, I don't know, that much, to allow for drop back bites, I'll wind it right up tight, so bang, they're either on or they're not. And then that, that stops that little millimet few millimetres at uh, sets a roller wheel going and just sort of makes a contact and makes a beeper go, the old buzzer, the right indicator. I've also got them fairly loud because I'm in here, partly deaf of my age. <laughs> and I, I don't want to wake up and the lion's on the other side of the lake. Beautiful evening, I have to say, full moon out there. All fairly cosy in here. Got my food bag there. Camera's going to be right there so I can lift it off. I can hear owls going. There's some other weird birds as well. But I'm sort of set out there, I'll show you the setup. So it's going to be a bit uh, a bit different now, guys, because <laughs> the main camera's crapped out. <laughs> I didn't delete the previous fishing trip, so I've got no memory card left on that. I'm okay for the floodlight. But I've got to use the GoPro, which is here, and I'm talking to that one, which is not working. I should be talking to this one. So here you go, that's the uh, camera light. So I'm using the camera with the floodlight on that, and we just get what we get with the GoPro, and that's all there is to it. So I'm all set up there. I changed over to the slightly heavier bobbins. Got the net there, and the other was just here. It's got a heavy bobbin as well. 
That's the setup. And that's where I am. Yeah, might have to use full power to uh, get anything from it. But if I get a hook up, hopefully I'll be able to show you guys a decent car. Got a blanket as well because I know it's going to get cold tonight. Extra jackets, towel for my head. Should be good, should be good. Well, wow, people, I don't know if you were going to see this with this light. I've got a beauty. There he is, let's get him out. It's definitely a double. It's a quite a big double actually. It has. I don't know what you're going to see of this. A pierced Tony have. If you look at it, no eye there. Let's just see what he weighs. Figure he's about close to 15. about 14.2 wow that is a nice fish guys the only way we're going to get pictures balance the uh, GoPro on top of this bait bucket hopefully I don't know how much light there is. I didn't think he was be far off at 15. Give me a head of a scrap. So there we go. That was worth a sleepless night. I'm sure you'll agree. A real cracker. I reckon those scales are wrong. It feels like 16 pounds. Good fish though. Let's get him back. I just got down on the bed chair. <laughs> I was in there five minutes. There we go. About 12 pounds. Good fish. Nice one to catch. Do you know what? Is it going to be one of those nights? I'm so pleased I came. It's not even midnight yet. Let's get the kitty back. Wow, well, people, I don't know what you're going to see in this. I just had a screamer of a take. It was just single toner. I thought, got to be something big, big carp. And it's a cracking great big tent. Look at the size of this thing. That is a nice fish, is it not? I feel that's the other side of five pounds, people. What a beauty. And late, really late, October. Holy smoly. We're pleased with that one in the uh, in the summer oh I wasn't exactly dozing off that's a nice fish Ooh. look at this one <laughs> late in the year like this amazing there's a big mist coming over the water that's uh tells you that's still warm water very very warm let's get it back so good session i can't show you much action because I got, you know, the, the big camera's gone so it's just out of the gopro and getting what I can here. Wow. That's a male tench as well, by the way. It starts with very twitchy little bites. and doesn't uh, really turn into much. The mist is just pouring past now. Why the tench? Now, it's a bream. I could just actually unhook this one in the water. That's your show in to you. Oh, there he goes. Got him off. Couldn't get him up. That's uh, a bream, so all on the same boilie as well. Now, let's put this 
there in a second. I'm going to put another bag together, and of course, my knees are soaked. And nothing on the other two rods, and they're straight straight out. Ironically, where I put most of the uh, bait. Right, let's get another bag out. Wow. <sighs> It was a fairly uneventful night. Two carps, or whatever that was, was 14, 15, something, 14 something. Another double. Two bream. And that really nice tench. That was a nice tench. It is now daylight, as you can see. And everything seems to shut down. So it was well worth me coming out. I know it's tough doing an all-nighter. It's kind of my age. It's definitely tough doing an all-nighter. It's even tougher getting out of this bed when I try and get the joints working. But at the end of the day, it's what it's about. You've got to be in it to win it. You've got to put the time in. My main camera here, I'd had that filled up. And a big mistake. I've done it before. I didn't delete clips from a previous strip. So, so I could have done, but when you're in the middle of the night, you don't fancy it. So I think it's from, it's breakfast time, can't even speak properly. Breakfast time, and then I'm just letting the, basically the bivvy dry out from all the dew. And uh, not looking forward to meeting my plumber and tearing the inside out of a bathroom suite because there's a problem with the leak. Got to be done though. Wow, what a, what a day for, well, autumn, late autumn. That is a setting, is it not? So talking about uh, lakes and floats and that, uh, we're down with Bill again, and Bill's going to run through some of his favourite, I'm going to call them his favourite ones, that's the ones he's caught the most fish on, and he has caught a lot of fish in lakes or still waters. So talk us through it then, Bill. Well, first and foremost, uh, when I was 13, my father, as long as he was fishing with me, could go out and fish the Metropolitan Water Board lakes near where we were. Some, this is London, so people... Some real yeah. Thames, yeah. Yeah. They're deep. I mean, Queen Mary in parts, 35, possibly 40 foot deep. Yeah. So you've got problems there. It's got to be a big float. Because um, it's got to be fished as a slider. You can, I don't know whether you'll pick that up. Yeah. That's a very small eye on that. Yeah. And it's stopped off with a, you know the old Billy Lane stop knot? Yes. Yeah, it's done, it's tied off with that. Yeah. And set at depth. Now, the problem was, you're up high on these reservoirs, they're built up. Concrete sides, I imagine, yeah? Well, concrete bowl with sides built up, going yeah. out. I mean, the first one I fished was at um, Sunbury, and it was 20-odd foot deep. And we couldn't get on with it. So Dad said, we'll have to work on some slider that we can see in the choppy water and yeah. everything else. Because it's open, so you're going to get wind, aren't you? That's the thing. You believe it. You believe it. So what we did, we took an antenna, which will be that part, and put a top on. So of what, balsa? That, be that one's yeah. balsa. Ray Mumford used a hell of a lot of peacock for that I've used balsa what we would do is I mean that I think this one actually holds over half an ounce <laughs> well yeah because you've got to sink 20 odd foot you yeah, ain't got to take time. it down yeah yeah be forever lasting waiting for the bait to get down yeah so what we did fish those with a slider being a turn up and you suddenly see as the weight settled it would go down to leave that yeah Great advantage, something picks it up, up it comes, you can't miss that stem sticking out, and away. Now we're talking about, possibly, I'm just trying to work it out, it'd be very early 60s, late 50s, we were using those up on the reservoir. Mainly I use worm, because I could catch big perch on it, Yeah. but some of the lads were catching some very big roach. But I must admit, by the time I'd reached... I think 
18 or 19, they got that Colmenaris and all the big roach and everything. Purgil, yeah. di- well, just wiped big out. Big die off, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, big die off. But people who I'm, I'm fishing with of that era, they'd all caught quite multiple catches of three pound ro- roach. In fact, I do know that one was over four. It's multiple, but they're saying multiple catches is <laughs> a three pound roach, he's saying. Yeah, so I've seen yeah. them in glass cases. Yeah. What made me laugh was I'm sitting there one night with gra- with uh, grandfather and father. And we're looking there and there's, suddenly these blokes running up, throwing in buckets of bridge. You weren't allowed to ground bait. Oh, we see, yeah, yeah. And they were doing this all the time. And one of those is reported to have had a four pound roach. Four pounds, man, yeah. Yeah, of course, they're packing it in. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you've got to remember Bill Penny's roach came from a. Bill Penny, I remember that, yeah, W. Penny, yeah. yeah that was four something, wasn't it? Yeah, that was four something. No. But what you're saying? I think three fourteen actually, not four really? pound. Yeah. The graduation marks on the float here. Yeah. You were saying earlier on, you don't always wait for the float to go under. No, mm. if it stops, all of a sudden going down, bang, strike. You strike, or yeah. indeed rises. They yeah. pick the bait up. I mean, let's face it. Nowadays, I think mine predates the um, drift beater by Drennan by yeah. quite a number of years. Yes. I mean that is a I'm just let me just work it out. Nineteen fifty eight float you're looking at. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alright, it's been painted out over again, but it's that's the era the collector's of collector's piece, yeah. The collector's piece. What about you other sort of late floats would you Mostly using? when we were fishing and it wasn't too rough. We we're fishing mainly peacock. That's a peacock quill, yeah. Yeah. With uh, the balsa body still? Balsa body, fished a long way out. Ivan Marks, of course, was the king of this. And if, actually, if you looked at the bottom of this, that is actually Ray Mumford's writing. That is Ray's. One so that's Ray. one he's made, is it? Yeah. yeah. Now, if you look, go further and look at the tip, they worked on an idea of contrast. The actual float was shotted there. Right? He gets a lift bite, of course it comes up, and you, your old eyes pick that yellow up straight, turn away. straight away and it's automatic, bang, you're in. Again, sliders. Interesting, no, yeah. Yeah. Something that's not done now, is it? Really deep deep water fishing, really? Well, I'm not going to say too much. And the other thing I found was a lot of the bream were, right, were coming up off the bottom. Really? Yeah. What um, would you be fishing for those bream, Bill? What would you... Worms, I suppose, or maggot, worm, yeah, that type of thing. Depends what the perch population was like. In yeah, the with place. The worms. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what are those ones, Emil? They're basically peacock. All the stem is peacock. This one's got a body on it to enable it to hold more weight. They're all fish slider, which means you know it's just attachment by the bottom ring and the, the old Billy Lane stop knot. That's what we used a lot on gravel pits to quite good effect. Now you got on there absolutely minuscule eyelets and that. Yeah. So that must be for a reason, mustn't it? Those tiny, tiny eyes. Yeah, it's, it's to stop the knot going through. Yeah. You know, because it's just really a whip, isn't it? Yeah. And it holds every time. And what, what do you make those, again, out of what would you make those tiny what? eyelets or do you buy those like that? I don't buy them those like that. I get a pin... Yeah. and wrap fuse wire around it and pull them back level and just crop them to size. So I've got a loop yeah. with two, two, two bits to whip on. And that's what that is. Made from fuse wire. Okay, moving on from there. We've done the drift beater. We've got the, the windy, the big reservoir sliders. Yes, we've got the big reservoir sliders. That's uh, a lift float, float. I buy the stems in already coloured and just stick them all together. Yeah. It's very easy, self assembly. Eyes pushing, gluing. They're plastic eyes because they're generally not fishing it that deep. As you might well realise with these, shot it down to there. Shot on the bottom, the minute it moves up, this comes up like a Polaris through the 
Do you strike as the float comes up? Yes, it's, anywhere on the way up, it's it's got it in its mouth. Yeah, it's moving. Bang, yeah. yeah. Just pick the shot up, yeah. Yeah. That's hence all those graduations are there in different colours. Yes, tell you. yes, that's it. I haven't put them on, I've bought them with those on, I've cheated on that. Yeah. But they've got, what, good half a dozen different segments there to give you yes, a that's variety it. Of, uh, of, of movement on the float. Yes, that's it. I mean, it's very much the same as with these floats. These, again, are wagglers, like those I've shown you there. But originally, we used to... Tip was black. We could usually see it against the sun. And if that yellow came up, bingo. You strike then, yeah? You strike, yes. It's not always... Just take away. You do get yeah. quite a few lift bites. Yeah. They're again peacock stemmed and a bit of crow quill reverse stuck in the top. Remember years ago when they were using a lot of crow quills, they would fish them traditionally with a bulbous top. To get something more sensitive, they turn them upside down. So you've got this little bit showing. Well, these are what we use for the crucians at uh, Marsh Farm. You see, they're just a stuck-in piece of um, yeah. crow quill stem. It's worked absolutely spot on for me. It takes hardly anything to pull those under. That's what people got to realise because they're not bodied, are they? So you just go straight under. Straight under, under there, straight under. Yeah, and what's particularly with crucians that are dib, 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 you know. There's no problem there. They can don't feel any resistance. They would take what sort of shot, Bill? Roughly, you know, what about uh, number some, ones or something? Or yeah, something like that. I can't remember what I lock on with them. I usually use number four. So the, the, some of them are four number fours going down to three number fours. And a few shot down the line, basically down the line number six. So margin fishing, we're talking for those, really. Yeah. Yes. Under yeah. the rod top, that match rod, straight under the rod top. Virtually like that. Yeah. That's, like, that's originally we were catching them at Marsh Farm before mm -hmm. the the crowds moved in. And is that one over the back on the right? It's got a wire stem to it. Does it look like that one? That's a different float altogether. Oh, yeah. There are the, the pole floats I use. Um, again. Made the same way, but I've got a glass stem in that I buy in. It's a fiberglass, is it? Yes. Yeah. It, but it's been painted. It says me painting them. I buy them in black. Uh, Bought a body, and the top is just a pulp float. Top, just stuck up. And basically deadly when it got, you know... Mm, 20 the, bites of finicky fish or something. Finicky fish, trotting, or just sitting out there... If we want to maybe often fish a bit further out somewhere like Marsh Farm for the Crucians, and that's what we uh, use. A useful little trotting float, as you can see, 0.7 of a, a gram. So it's under, well under a swan shot. And a very small, is it an eyelet on the bottom of that? No, one? That just got a, attached double rubber. Double rubber in that one, yeah. Yeah, that's that. This is a float built and made foot by the great um, Ray Mumford. If you can pick it up, you'll see there's a real ring there. Yeah. So it's still fish double, one ring, and on the bottom, as you can see, it's... Uh, That's a tiny ring on there. Oh, yeah, yeah he was a master of them. He went down a lot finer than I did. So, Bill, you obviously are big on float fishing. You're going in deep water. You're going at distance. Why would you be using the float over something like a swim feeder? Flexibility. One of the tricks I have learned is that the bream, particularly when it starts getting bright, they come up maybe six foot up. Off the and, bottom, yeah. Yeah, and I've taken them like that. When I was pre-baiting sheep walk, where they caught the record tench, OK, we did pre-bait for, I think it was seven weeks, but a group of us, morning and evening. When I came after about after six weeks and I threw some bait in, believe it or not, in 14 foot of water, the tench were boiling on the top for it. Really? So yeah. you, you can't adjust the feeder, you are on the bottom. Yeah. We was having a sliding float. I you just got came the up. Yeah, you got yeah the I came up. And as the day went on, yeah. I was increasing, dropping the stop not further and further down till eventually the last few fish were actually taken on the bottom. But the majority of them, well, 
I started off about two foot odd deep, three foot deep, and gradually as I got spooked, let's say at three foot, I'd go down to five foot. Down and down and down. And bear in mind, I've, I've pulled these fish up from 14 foot down to possibly two to three foot off, off the surface. Yeah, and that's by loose feed? Uh, uh, loose feed, loose feed, regular loose feed. Yeah. So you need a good, accurate catapulting around the float all the time? Well, yes, yeah, no no problem with that. And no trouble with the loose feed, thanks yeah. to dear old Bob Baker of Richworth. I was teaching some of their children from Richworth, and I said, I've got, got a note there. Would I come and collect a hundred weight of, I think that's six mil, oh, mini, mini boilies, because they put the wrong colour in and they were going to throw them away. I mean, I was around there after school. Like, yes, I shot, uh, yes, and that's what we were feeding them on. And not only was it working, it was bringing them up off the bottom, but it was also selective. If anyone jumped a uh, swim, which we only had one bloke do it on Maggot, yeah. and he was using a monofina, he never got a bite. I moved in after him, yeah. and I walked well over £100. I think I had 176 or something like that. Yeah. He was well pleased, but he shouldn't have pinched a swim, should he? She shouldn't have pinched my swim. I knew it was going to happen because someone was watching me with binoculars the day before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's... It goes on. That's what happened then, didn't it? Yes, I'm afraid so. Some people are dead unscrupulous, but yeah. there again, I don't own the water. And then finally, Bill, that's Ray Mumford's bulbous waggler there, that small one, is it? It's one of his early Zuma floats. It's um, leaded. It, this is in the 50s, this one. It's is, is it that old, that one? Is that a copy of it, or is that... Yeah, no, that's, the actual, that's an actual Ray Mumford. That's really? not a... That was built by... Copy, yeah. yeah. Bit of history there. Oh, yeah, it's got a bit chipped away there over a period of time, but yeah, it's a genuine Ray Mumford, uh, nine, about 19, I imagine 55, something like wow, that. really. And again, you can see the graduation, so you can tell him way back then. Oh yeah, he was into it all of that. It tiniest bite, so it's not like those graduations are new. Yeah. They've been nothing No, new. no, no, nothing. Um, I mean, Ray and I go back, what, when I was... 18, I met him for the first time, which would yeah. be uh, early 60s. Yeah. And uh, he was, um, again, without doubt, outstanding angler. And I, I bumped into him outside Hawkers. I'd been working that day and I popped in yeah. with a feeder to ledger out on bread to try and get some bream. The light's failing. He'd been flogging away all day because he had a match. He'd had about 12 pounds of dice. And suddenly, Wallop, five pound bream. Wallop, five pound bream. He come up to me, he said, uh oh. He said, I could be in trouble here. He said, I think I'm going to have to switch over to the feeder for the match. I said, don't bother because you won't get a bite. I said, remember the light's going. Yeah. I said, another ha half an hour or so. Yeah. Yeah, it's pitch black. You wouldn't see a float out there. With the float fishing, just to give us a close out there, what's your suggestion uh, for beginners and that? Would it be. Uh, Little and often is, is the big drawback with float fishermen today. Beginners going in, they just don't put the feed in. I regular. think it's just not putting the feed in. Yeah. Little and often, feed every tr trot if you have to. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And the same on a lake, if you're on a lake. Just... Oh, keep the feed going. You can tell a good angler on a long range waggler. You just buy a number of catapults he's carrying yeah. because if he snaps one, he's got a couple in spare. Oh, yes. I'm always carrying five or six catapults. Yeah. Well, Bill, listen, I appreciate it. There's a lot of tips there for people. Yeah. A lot of interest, a lot of history. All you people out there, anglers, young or old alike, it doesn't really make any difference. Get out there and try a bit of float fishing because taking from me and Bill, it's entertaining. <laughs>